Welcome as you're coming in. Happy Earth Day. We'll get started in just a minute. We'll let everybody sort of filter in here. Welcome, welcome. We'll give everybody just another minute to come in here. Happy Earth Day. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll get started in just a sec. Looks like, it looks like everybody who is in the waiting room may have already come in. Alexis, are we good to get going? We are good. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, happy Earth Week. Happy Earth Day. Welcome to the to the National Society of High School Scholars Earth Day virtual presentation and, and panel discussion. We're in for a treat tonight. We're going to have a great conversation with some incredible um, young people who are doing incredible work for our planet. Um, and I hopefully you guys are, have good questions. We'll have some, some an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Um, and the goal for tonight is really to, to think about the opportunities that you have to be able to, to make a difference. Um, my name is Courtney Kimmel. I am with the Captain Planet Foundation. We are one of, or we're really, really pl uh, pleased and honored to be the, the sponsors and the hosts for tonight's session. Um, and Captain Planet Foundation, if you haven't heard of us, and you probably haven't, um, we are based on the, an original cartoon show from the early 90s, which if you go on YouTube, you can find the videos. They're, they're funny animation, but incredible cast, like Google them, it's wild. Um, but the show is about five young people from different parts of the world who were given these incredible uh, magic rings and they controlled different elements of, of nature. And when they saw an environmental environmental problem and they were all over the world they're from five different continents when they saw an environmental problem they would put their rings together and by their powers combined they would call down captain planet and together they would solve these environmental problems um the little known fact is that captain planet was actually a metaphor for the collaboration the power of collaboration of young people from around the world working together on these problems sound familiar um, so the Captain Planet Foundation is really, uh, our mission is engaging and empowering young people from around the world to be problem solvers for the planet, people just like yourselves. Um, and we've been around for about 30 years. So it's, we've been around a while. We're based in the U.S. and in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and for the first 20 years, I'd say, of the organization, uh, we worked primarily through schools and with educators to develop curriculum and stuff like that. And you guys changed the way we work. Because we have these, it makes it a lot easier to get information. We see these problems. We don't really have a ton of time to learn about it and write curriculum and figure out like, you know, what's the evaluation tool. A lot of the young people like yourselves were knocking on our doors and saying, we need, we need to act now. Um, and so we've pivoted the way that we do work. Uh, and we're, we'll hear from John. John is one of the young people who have helped us sort of, sort of imagine how do we do that. Um, and we created an organization or a program called the Planeteer Alliance. And the Planeteer Alliance is this global community of young people just like yourselves from different parts of the world who are passionate about environmental action, um, who are ready for action, um, and who are working together to create these campaigns for change to adjust these problems. Um, so at the end of the day, Check it out. I would love to have all of you as part of the Planetary Alliance. It's free. It's incredible. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, one thing to note is that Planetary Alliance is completely youth designed and youth driven. So we've been doing this work for a while. We're like, how do we build this program? We brought together 14 young people from all over the world and said, build us, tell us how to build this program. Um, and so they they broke into teams and for two months, they designed the Planetary Alliance. They came back, they gave us all of their input and said, here's the blueprint, now go. So we built Planetary Alliance to spec based on this design squad's uh, recommendations. And then we have uh, the Wisdom Council, which John, our moderator is part of and an ambassador um, who are helping us sort of make decisions and figure out what that looks like today. So one thing to note about us and our work is that we are listening to you. Um, we're trying to be as responsive and figure out what, you know, be responsive to your needs um, to be able to, to be supportive uh, in the work that you're doing. We are really focused around climate change, 
Um, we have young people who are incredibly passionate about everything from sharks to mangroves to butterflies and all of these incredible important issues. But I think at the end of the day, what we've what we've been able to say is is a common denominator is if we don't address climate change, all of these things are in peril, right? And so it becomes this this equalizer, um, where if we can start to organize around known solutions, then we can start to make a difference. Like we can address all of these problems that everybody brings to the table. Um, Climate change is big, it's scary, it's complex, but the good news is it's not a mystery, right? We know what the sources are, we know what the causes are, we know how to address those problems. It's not a function of science, it's not a function of technology, it's not really a function of money, it's a function of leadership, right? And you all as young people are incredibly effective and powerful in being able to urge decision makers and leaders to make the right choice. Um, and so Planetary Alliance is, is organized around these, these solutions the original show is based on the, like I said, the rings. And so we've used those elements to organize known solutions. So earth is all about food and soil and forests and how do those, those systems play a role in addressing climate change. Fire is about transitioning away from fossil fuels and towards clean renewable energy. What does that look like? What does that look like in your community? What does that look like in your country, in your state, wherever, transportation, energy, that kind of stuff. Wind is about circularity. Think about wind being never really ending. Um, it's about how do we get away from extractive industry that we dump, right? We like pull a bunch of resources out of the ground, make a thing and then throw it away after one use. How do we get away from single use? How do we get towards uh, end of end of product sort of design where we're reusing and reclaiming and, and recycling? Uh, water is about oceans and lakes and coastal wetlands and, and mangroves, which we'll hear about today, um, which are really important carbon sequestering systems and, and sinks. So what is the value of those and how do we protect those? And then heart, heart is our centering element. Heart is really a reminder for us, all of us, to lead with hope, to lead with empathy, right? And to really focus on centering justice and equity in the work that we do, uh, not just creating solutions that benefit a few, but how do we make sure that the solutions that we develop and we implement help everybody um, and especially help those who are disproportionately impacted. So that's the framework that we work with with Planetary Alliance. Um, and it's all about solutions and campaigns. So when you, when we, if let's say you're really interested in food waste, um, we have a whole group of people who are really interested in food waste who are doing composting and, and menu waste, which is a major contributor of methane. Right. And all these young people in different parts of the world are creating these campaigns, which are action projects, right? They're their plans for creating a change that are time bound. So it's in the next six. Um, so the campaigns are that and you'll if you join, you'll have an opportunity. Cool, cool model. Um, we have a, an online community that's it's you know, bringing all these ideas, all these resources to bear. We have young people from around the world who are joining and, and joining in these conversations, helping each other, supporting each other when they're when they're running into barriers. Um, we have planetier clubs. So if you have a school club, a green team, an environmental club, an after school club, a boys and girls club that is interested in bringing this kind of work into your club, um, we have a way for clubs to to become planetier clubs. Um, or it can just fit into your existing programming. And Planetier Clubs uh, qualify, they, we, we provide small grants to help with projects. We provide grants to help with hosting events for your community to engage more of your friends and your peers in this work. Um, and again, all of this is completely free of charge. So it's it's really just a, a way of helping you as a community of young people who want to do this work um, to, to do it, right? Like to, to get the resources, to get the things that you need, to, to amplify your work and be successful. Um, and just real quick, a pitch, we have uh, these global summits. And these are in-person events that young people are hosting in locations all around the world. Last year was focused on water. Uh, we had 10 locations in different parts of the world that all brought together, I guess, total about 650 young people from in all around water. Um, and so these, these events took place all over the, the planet the same weekend. Uh, this year we're hosting one focused on plastic. So it'll happen on the same weekend, last weekend of July, all over the world. 
Um, so if you're interested in joining and hosting one of these summits, we offer small grants to support the cost of those events. And the idea is really just to galvanize your community and young people in your community to take on these challenges and then become part of this larger community that you can that you know you're not doing this work alone. Um, so this and the, the cool thing is the WIND Summit is, is in partnership with the United Nations Environment Program. So there's going to be even more interesting stuff happening with that. Okay, that was a lot. So Planeteer Alliance, if, you, um, if you're interested in this work, if you're interested in joining a, a, a global community of young people that are doing this work, check it out, planeteeralliance.com. Um, but with you've heard enough from me. <laughs> I am really excited about this panel. Um, we are going to be talking to a number of young people uh, in your community who have been doing incredible work. Um, we have a moderator, John Abad, who is uh, one of our a planeteer who's been engaged with Captain Planet for several years. Um, and we'll be hearing from two of our Be More winners, uh, Chase Hartman and Navita Mahesh, um, about their work. And Will, who is a, a, a national high school scholar rock star, um, we'll be hearing about his work too. And then we'll be over, we'll be able to have a, a conversation. So be thinking about your questions. Um, Think about like what about this work inspires you? How can you build on it? How can you learn from it? Um, but without further ado, I am going to turn it over to John, our moderator. So, John, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. My name is John Abad, and I am the 18 year old founder of the nonprofit organization Save Our Planet. As uh, is there, I am originally from Lima, Peru, and I am very passionate about the ocean health. At the age of 14, like, I founded this nonprofit to coordinate massive cleanups involving more than 2,400 participants to clean the beautiful beaches, rivers, and lakes of Peru. However, during the pandemic, in-person activities were not possible. So thanks to Captain Planet Foundation, I conducted scientific research on the most polluted beach in Peru. We analyzed debris data, tested water quality, and interviewed the surrounding community. This research earned the Action for Nature's International Journey of Hero Award, which allowed this initiative to be recognized by authorities in the city. And more recently, as Courtney already mentioned, I was one of the 10 hosts who hosted this summit for the water conservation. And we partnered with different environmental activists from the Amazing Planetary Alliance. And personally, I co-organized a two-day international conference about water conservation. We, as Corny already said, we impacted more than 600 young people from more than 10 strategic places in the world. And this conference gathered notable international activists and delegations from other countries. And we taught youth about public speaking and environmental activism. So if you also want to make a difference for the environment, make sure to follow the Captain Planet Foundation and the Planeteer Alliance. I strongly believe that as young people, we represent 25% of the population, but we are also 100% of the future. And our three speakers today are the best examples of this. So first, we will go to Chase Hartman. Chase, please tell us more about your amazing project for the planet. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Chase Hartman. Just a little bit about me. I'm 17 years old. I'm a junior in high school. I am in my school student government, and I'm a competitive swimmer. And seven years ago, I started a book distribution project called Read Repeat, which evolved into a nonprofit called Eco Brothers. I'm so grateful for NSHSS, and I recently received the Be More Fund for $10,000 to help promote sustainability through this grant by purchasing little free libraries to be put into schools so kids could exchange books they already read but instead of buying new ones. But I'll get into all that later. Here's where it all began. Think about all, all of the old books you were lying around your house. When was the last time you opened one of them? Are some of them deeply stored away in maybe your basement or your closet? When I was just 10 years old, I came into this realization one summer day with my friend. I came across a local company near my mom's office who had thousands of giant bins of books that they were throwing away. And I didn't want to see all these books end up in a landfill. That really concerned me. I loved reading and I wanted to share these books with others. I knew I could combine both my passions of helping the environment and helping others into one project. This was the perfect opportunity to, for me to bring my community together and solve one small problem that could possibly change thousands of lives. I asked the company if I could have these books, and they immediately gave me 4,000 used books. My project called Read Repeat was born. These boxes were huge, and at first we didn't really know what to do, and my best friend and I started sorting during our free time, 
and collected even more books. We ran book collections through our sports clubs, Boy Scouts, and other organizations. And once we got a couple thousand kids books sorted, we contacted a local elementary school. We set up tables with mountains of books for the kids to choose a couple of books to keep for their own. It feels really great promoting reuse and encouraging people to donate something they no longer want for others to enjoy it. I've learned that, that books are really hard to recycle because of the glue and their binding. So what I'm doing is very important. Encouraging my community to clean out their houses of these old books creates a big impact because I can provide others with free books that would have been thrown away if someone hadn't taken action. I've estimated that we've kept at least 75 tons of used books out of landfills. And by promoting reuse, instead of encouraging others to purchase books, we've saved 6,000 trees. And I'm pretty sure that's a whole forest. I've now distributed over 210,000 books and five little free, little free libraries to more than 55,000 students in Florida. I never would have thought that I had the ability to make such a great impact while up also uplifting my peers and providing them with resources that could help the growth of their future. I felt that it was important for this project to become even more sustainable, so I raised funds to purchase little free libraries and I applied for the NSHSS Be More grant uh, so I could donate these little, little free libraries to schools um, who currently don't have one. And I encourage the kids to share their books when they've outgrown them with the simple concept of take a book, leave a book. I let them know that by sharing with others, they're taking part in community service and community service builds confidence. I can't do it all myself. So these little free libraries are a great way for my community to engage in reusing and exchanging books whenever they want. People often ask me, how can they start a project and how can they make an impact? I've been doing this for seven years and looking back on it, if I would have set a goal to raise $100,000 or collect 200,000 books, I definitely would have been intimidated by my goal or even talk myself out of it. So instead I took it one step at a time, one book at a time, and I solved one problem at a time. Starting local is very important. And sometimes a grand idea that might involve a lot of traveling or other needs might create a negative environmental impact. So my recommendation to you is to identify your local needs and focus on places that you're more familiar with. It will be easier to make connections and know who to go to when building your initiative. And having a community of supporters such as your friends and family is very important when starting your project. And at the start of my project, most of the book do donations I received were from my friends and clubs that I was involved in. It's simple about it if you think about it in small steps. Everyone can clean off their own shelf at home and find a local little free library in their area to donate their books to. They might not know it then, but they're promoting reuse and helping others have access to free books. Give it a try. If you feel like you want to do more, why not run a neighborhood book collection or team up with your local sports club and run a book drive with them? When you get the books, contact a media specialist at a local school and see if they want the children's books to give to their students. That's how my project began, and by seeing a need and finding a way to fill this need. Small acts of service can make a big impact, whether it's collecting books, running a beach cleanup, or planting a butterfly garden, you can do it. This Earth Day is the perfect time to start. Set small goals and work to achieve them. Pretty soon, you'll realize your efforts have changed the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chase. This project sounds amazing, and I really admire how you are combining helping others and also helping the planet. What you said is so powerful. Start local and focus on places you are familiar with. Without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Navira to begin her presentation. Navira, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Navira, and um, my project was reduce food wastage in local restaurants. Um, I want to give a little introduction about myself. I am a high school senior and I am nonprofit leader of my uh, nonprofit organization for Girls for Change. And that's how, um, and I applied for this NSHS SSB More Fund grant to help raise $10,000 for my reduced food wastage and local restaurants project to extend on to local mom and pop restaurants. And I'm also an active Girl Scout, and this is how this project initially started with my Girl Scout Gold Award, where I worked with a local McDonald's. So I wanted it to come into our more our local community and go extend it to our local mom and pop restaurants who don't necessarily have the resources as McDonald's to help do this project. So um, the grant has helped me create the funding for to help these restaurants. So I want to talk more about my project, and I want to play a short video of of my project.
Are you able to share your screen? Yes. Okay. Last year, I founded my nonprofit, Four Girls for Change, with the vision to inspire kids to start small and dream big. In less than two years, we have raised more than $18,000 from our fundraisers and spent over $12,000 to support projects through our nine nonprofit partners. We also completed 19 donation drives to raise over 2006. Sorry. Um... and 600 pounds of food, and we made $10,000 in monetary contribution. Can you see my screen now? No. Oh, sorry. We also completed 19 donation drives to raise over 2,600 pounds of food and we made $10,000 in monetary contributions. As an active Girl Scout since third grade, I'm very involved in community projects. Last year, I got the idea to get local restaurants to donate their reusable food items to feed the hungry in my local community. This motivated my Girl Scout Gold Award project with McDonald's and Wellburn Management to reduce food wastage in their local restaurants. Three months back, I won the Gold Award for this project. In just 11 months, over 1,300 pounds of restaurant food has been donated. Now, I plan to extend the project to smaller local restaurants through my nonprofit with your $10,000 fund. So this is the presentation I played for the Be More Fund, and um, it was to extend the project to 10 local mom and pop restaurants. And um, can you go back to the slide so I can show the four-step process for my project? Thank you so much. Yes, so my project goes through a simple four-step process. And first, um, for Girls for Change, we identify the donor restaurant and recipient nonprofit in our local community. So I'm from Woodbridge, Virginia. So we are currently working with a local Thai restaurant and um, a local Indian restaurant here. And we work, we're working with these restaurants to help donate to a homeless shelter named Streetlight. And then um, for step two, we work with Food Donation Connection, which is the company that brings the food from the local mom and pop restaurant to the nonprofit. And the unused food from every week goes to this local nonprofit. And the um, Food Donation Connection has an app where the um, where the restaurant can log the food, what they have for the week, and set up a time for the nonprofit to come pick it up. So every week on a Tuesday, um, they've been picking up the food constantly and giving it to the homeless shelter named Streetlight that we're currently working with. And um, step three is that, the, like I said, the restaurant hygienically stores these food items and donates it weekly. And the, ultimately when they give it to the homeless shelter, they are using it again instead of uh, going to the landfills. And actually landfill waste is one of the main contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. And this project has so far um, reduced over 150 pounds of methane gas emissions going into the atmosphere. And this is because this food was getting redirected to these, um, to these nonprofits instead of the local, um, to the um, landfill. So it's a very environmental friendly um, project. It's not just about reducing food wastage, it's also reducing the greenhouse gas emissions going into the atmosphere. So it's very interdisciplinary and I'm very grateful that this fund has been helping to help make it possible for these local mom and pop restaurants. So that is I mean, part of my um, project. Um, next slide, please. Yes, so these were the main focus areas for my project and the um, number one with encouraging more restaurant participation was something that we um, struggled with at the beginning with these local mom and pop restaurants is because they weren't worried about having enough resources to help start this project and helping it become long term. So one thing when we did work with the Thai restaurant in our local area, they were a little concerned because they did not have the freezer for to store these items. 
as much. So we said that we could use a, we a budgeted a thousand dollars for re, um, per restaurant, and we wanted ten of them. So hopefully, ten of them. So right now, um, and we actually helped buy a freezer for them so they could store these foods, uh, food for the week, and then um, to help make it easier as possible for them because we want this to be a long term and sustainable project and not just stop once um, Four Girls for Change like initially starts it up, but we want them to continue it and have the long-term impacts of this project. And so that obviously streamlines the process for restaurant participation and feeds the local homeless and hungry with street light, the local homeless shelter. And ultimately it helps the environment because it is reducing landfill waste. Um, we have um, saved over 1,500 pounds of food um, from going into the landfill and said it's getting reused to these homeless shelters. And I said before, the 150 um, pounds of greenhouse gas emissions um, being reduced. And then finally, also another benefit for these restaurants is that they get tax deduction as well. And they've gotten over $2,400 worth of tax deduction so far. And so it is an amazing project. It has so many benefits for restaurant and also for environment. So I'm very grateful that this fund is helping me to do this. And um, I just want to um, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, wow, Navira has shown us that like one person can make a difference and that small actions can lead to significant change. By reducing food wa waste in local restaurants, she said that she's not only helping reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but she is also impacting the lives of people in her community by feeding the local homeless. And I think like that's a very amazing initiative. Last but not least, we will hear about Will's project. Will, please tell us about how you're changing the world. Hi everyone. So today, instead of me telling you guys, I'd like to share this video, sort of how I got started and the recent project I've been working on. All right, and let's go. I live in Miami, Florida, along the coast, ground zero for sea level rise. If climate change continues at this rate, in 50 years, our whole city is going to be underwater. Coastline protection is really important to me. Here in South Florida, these mangrove forests can actually play a huge role. I'm Will Sheruis. I'm 16 years old. My project is called The Million Mangroves. In 2017, Hurricane Irma really affected both my home and my school. And there was even a boat that washed up on my football field. I happened to be learning about climate change in school, and I just felt I had to do something. I felt the need. My action started with just advocacy. I would just tell my friends, try and get them involved and get them to see the real importance of this issue. I started to bring it up in my community. And eventually, I was able to attend different climate conferences around the world to speak on behalf of the youth voice. But then during the pandemic, I bought an old used kayak and was able to explore the mangroves right outside my home. I began to see the beauty in mangroves and realized the importance of these trees. Mangroves protect our coastlines and prevent coastline erosion. They provide a great habitat for organisms, and they take a massive amount of carbon out of the atmosphere, much more than traditional forests or jungles. Unfortunately, there were large amounts of trash in the mangroves. Tons of little trash that people may disregard as unimportant. However, toxins seep into the soil, preventing them from growing and killing them. It's really an issue, and I felt like I had a moral obligation to pick it up. At first, it was just me in a kayak. I cleaned up around six miles of mangroves, stressing all the way down to the Keys. I started telling my friends about the mangrove project, and they were really enthusiastic about it, and they encouraged me. They wanted to make a difference, too. I began to be more confident. I began to just ask more people to come. Then we got big groups to help us pick up. Every month, I organized a cleanup. Tons of different people around Miami show up. People from my school, my community, my friends. People go out with gloves, a bucket, and some tools and go pick up trash. It's pretty simple and it's cheap and effective and easy. It's not necessarily a big commitment. And there's actually a fun component in these cleanups. And it's hanging out with your friends and helping out the environment. On top of the cleanups, the other part of the project is the planning. Since the goal is to help at least a million mangroves thrive in their environment, what better way to help out than to plant more mangroves myself? First, I pick up the mangrove propagules and grow them for about a year and a half until they're ready to be transplanted into the earth. I go out at low tide and find a place that's along the shore but not submerged. And so when the tide comes in, the mangroves are watered. 
I'm experimenting in my lab by grafting two mangroves together to try and create a mangrove that withstands Earth's stronger environmental stresses of today, like more acidic oceans and warmer waters. At the beginning, only around 20% of the mangroves survived, but now I'm getting to the point where around 70% survive and are able to grow in these tough conditions. I'd really love to come back one day and see the mangroves that I've planted turn into a mangrove forest. Even a small difference is a difference. Eco-anxiety is what a lot of people my age feel about the environment, that we're already past the point of no return. I'd like to have an optimistic outlook. I think that this generation will be the generation to halt climate change and to really make the difference we need. There's no planet B, and I'm not moving to Mars. <laughs> Thank you. So for the past couple of years, I've also worked with Dr. Jane Goodall, who to me is the environmental icon of our time. She's, 80, she's 89 now, but she still goes nonstop. And so I want to share you guys some things she said the last time I saw her. Humans are the most intelligent species to ever walk this planet. How is it then that we are destroying our only home? And I mean, you guys all know this. These, some of these statistics are from this year. Temperatures reached their hottest year in recorded history. The world oceans hit their warmest levels on record for the fourth consecutive year. And here in the United States, last year alone, there were 18 climate-related disasters with losses of over $1 billion, and more importantly, hundreds of lives. But there is some good news. And out of this destruction, we are finally starting to turn the tide against climate change. Researchers are developing ways to break down plastic in days rather than years, and we're not far out from roads, windows, and even our phone screens capturing solar energy. For the first time in decades, though fossil fuel use is still increasing, the increase is finally slowing down. So where do we go from here? It starts with all of us, right here, right now. And if I can leave you guys with anything, it's this, that every change that ever happened in this world started with the power of one. Every one of us can make a difference. Pick one thing, and it can be anything, something small at home or a big project with friends, then just simply start. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Will is an example that you're never too young to make a difference. He said it. At first, he started with a, with a kajak, but with clear goals and passion, he brought a movement to clean the mangrove, which are some of the most important carbon sinks in the entire planet. Now, we will go on to the most exciting part of the panel. We will hear from you. So do not hesitate to drop your questions down below for all the speakers or specifically one of them. So while we are waiting for your questions, I have a personal question to all of you. Uh, like, as think of someone who has recently gained interest in climate change. Like, what are some of the first steps that you will tell them to be an advocate, to become an advocate for a planet? I can sort of start this one off. Um, sorry. I think a lot of youth nowadays suffer from eco-anxiety. Uh, I talked a little bit about it in the video, but it's really important and it's really necessary to keep an optimistic outlook and to realize that if we all work together, we can make the difference we need. So it's really important to work as one whole, as one whole community and to stay optimistic. Yeah, I really like that, uh, that response. And something that I was going to say is just, to come together with your friends and your community. Um, you know, how I said in my speech, how you should start local, I feel like it's really important to identify those local issues and one way um, to do it more efficiently and to, um, you know, be happy while doing it is to be doing it with, with your friends. Yes, um, I agree. And going off with what Chase said, like be doing it with your friends as well. And it's just, important to be aware of what's going on in your local community as well and just seeing what's going on so for like this is just one example here for us was that recycling laws recently changed for us in Virginia and they stopped accepting anything other than one and two number plastics so that is something that a lot of people weren't aware of so I think just spreading the word like little um, companies as well they've been starting to do that so just being aware of what's going around is a big step and just doing that as well right Awesome. Thank you very much, guys, for the feedback. Here we are receiving some questions from the public. And the first one is, how do you guys go about getting financial support for your organizations with partnerships? 
So a lot of the financial support for my project comes from grants such as this grant from NSHSS. And my advice for getting uh, financial support like this is to um, just go into it with an idea, go into it with a passion. And, you know, most of the time you will get good results from that. I This Be More Fund was the first thing that I applied for through NSHSS. And I saw this as an opportunity to expand kind of a different part of my project. So, you know, going into it confident and with initiative for your project is just really important. Um, one main thing was for us was fundraisers. We did do a lot of fundraisers um, with holiday fundraisers and also when Four Girls for Change initially started and just reaching out to your family and friends and saying what you want to do, like show them a clear picture of what you want to do, obviously, and they are always so willing to help with um, any local community issues as well. So just spreading the word and reaching out to your local um, family and friends and even just asking them to spread the word as well really helped gain a lot of support for me personally. And we were able to raise a lot of support and money for a lot of the projects that we were doing for Four Girls for Change. Sort of like space, a lot of my financial support comes through grants. And to me, it's really important for me to knock on as many doors as I can or send as many emails out there because I mean it's important to get the word out and a lot of these organizations and a lot of these companies really want to help out too so that's how that's the main way I get about this financial support thank you guys as you said persistence is key in this part of the advocacy we also got a second question which says what are your research and development methods in your project? I'd say a lot of my research for my project, kind of identifying needs about my project is going out into my community and kind of experiencing it. So when I first started my project, it was a lot of, my project was mostly focused on reusing my books and getting these books into uh, kids, or hands of kids in schools. But it kind of, as I went into these schools, I got to meet the media specialists. I talked to people. I saw a firsthand experience of um, how these kids were in schools. And I saw um, a greater need for certain types of books, such as books, books of diversity, so kids could get, rep or kids would see themselves in the books that they read. So kind of just going out there, starting your project. And then if if you see kind of a surface level need, you'll be able to, you know, really dive down and see more specific project or problems through your project as you gain more experience. In my case, um, interesting, interestingly enough, I didn't realize the importance of mangroves at the beginning. It was after actually, unfortunately, a collapse in my neighborhood of a building where I learned that mangroves could have prevented that because mangroves do three main things they help they're one of nature's birth one of nature's best carbon sequestering devices they're also a great habitat for marine life and they also help stop soil erosion which this soil erosion and this saltwater increase were the causes for this uh, building collapse so after researching about mangroves i realized the importance and that's led me to develop this passion for them and to realize that we really need them, especially here in South Florida. Um, for my end, for um, our local community, food insecurity was a huge thing, especially during COVID for us. And we started um, in February 2021. And one of the main issues that we realized was that a lot of um, school kids were not getting their meals that they wanted because in a lot of parents relied on school lunches, but obviously due to that time where school was virtual, it was just um, not possible for parents to like um, fully uh, provide food. So that's why a lot of these food banks needed, they had th this list of top five needed items. So our initial projects was to help raise funds to buy these top five needed items for these food banks, food rescue programs, and also local homeless shelter as well. So just finding out that food insecurity was the main issue was um, very alarming for us. 
at the beginning. So we wanted to really focus on that. And that's how we extended on to reduce food wastage in local restaurants as well. So just looking at the issues in your local community, like it can even be in like in your local newspaper um, magazines and like even just like our local um, websites as well. Like you can find out so many local issues happening. So that is one how one reason why we were focusing on that. Thank you guys for all that information. As you, as most of you have done, you have partnered with the community or also with other nonprofits. And our, our third question asks, what is the best way to get in touch with your local government? So I haven't necessarily gotten into touch with the local government, but I've um, had a lot of experience with talking to the school board. So my um, public school county board, um, I kind of got connected with my teachers and asked them how I could get connected to the school board. So I would recommend finding maybe if your parent has a friend who works for the government or for um, some local government, um, maybe starting you know, at, to try to ask one of them questions and maybe they can get you connected to um, someone at the local government. In my case, um, for me, I started out just at a local level, a small community level, and then, you know, getting more and more confident, reaching out to people. And that has really helped me. Also, like I was saying earlier with the grants, it's really important to just shoot off as many emails as you can to elected officials or people in your community who have the power because they may not realize that us youth know what needs to be done or are heading in the right direction but in reality we do know the solution like we know the solutions we know the issue and we have a good understanding of what needs to be done um will and chase covered most of it but i just want to emphasize the emails it's that you have to like constantly keep sending these emails and if they're not like responsive just send a quick like reminder email and they will appreciate that because sometimes it gets buried in their inbox and then we could just give them a reminder. And that's something that we did. I didn't really um, reach out to um, gov um, local government as much, but but the school board a little, um, actually we have a board of advisors and one of our board of advisors is um, one of the chairmen of the school board. So he provided a lot of contacts for Four Girls for Change. So like building those connections, networking and like emails, like making sure to keep the um, communication that is was like most successful for us. Thank you guys for sharing all those tips about networking and how making those connections can help your campaign be stronger. But sometimes when we are just beginning, it's hard to reach out to the community or gather people and say the right things. So someone asked, what would be a good way to start a project in this situation? Um, I can start with yeah. this. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, my, um, I mainly I, um, identified the local food banks, food rescue programs, and homeless shelter. And I actually started um, doing emails, I mean, sending emails to them. And that is how I initially made contact with them and then went on to phone calls and just um, talking to them of what we wanted to do. So obviously they want to know what our goal is as an organization and for thinking about this long term as well. But the one thing that really surprised me the most is like how willing they are to have all the report, uh, all the support that they want. And actually our first phone call was to the local homeless shelter named Streetlight. And um, Ms. Rose Power, she's the executive director. Like she's one of my closest um, contacts of um, since 2021. And it's just the support, that encouragement that we've gotten from all these individuals is what made this work so much more meaningful. And we're um, just, I'm so grateful that they were so willing for letting us to help, but it's really not too hard to gain these connections. It's just, you have to make sure to find the right people. And because they're always willing for, um, they always need help, especially right now coming out of COVID as well. That is, it's very essential right now, so. I really like that point. And something I would like to add is I started my project when I was in fifth grade. So I kind of really just built the project off of my love for reading. So one way that I started my project is by talking to my teacher at my school. She was probably one of the most supportive figures um, and she it still is today helping my project, even though it's been seven whole years. 
So talking to your teachers or talking to your friends, believe it or not, your friends might share the same passions as you, and they will be willing to help you um, and support you throughout your projects. So there's, you know, you're going to have a giant support system. Your whole community is going to be willing to help you. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It's really important to start off, start off talking about talking to your family members, your friends, seeing what they think, seeing if they have any advice. And I mean, they'll definitely be supportive of what you have to do. And so that's just, in my opinion, that's the number one way to start. Can I actually chime in for a sec? We, I've worked with a lot of young people who um, are doing this work. And I'd say the hardest step is the first step. And it's just taking that step, right? And I get, I bet all of you can agree with that. It's like, you can overanalyze, you can overthink. And I, I guarantee you, all of your plans have changed, right? From like the first step that you took, you thought it was going to go one way and it went totally a different way and you adapted and you figured it out, right? And so I think the, the hardest step is that first step. Um, so you don't hesitate to take it, even if you don't know 100% how it's going to work out. Um, just take the first step, see where it leads. <laughs> Thank you guys for sharing all these amazing insights. And I feel like also having a network that the Planeteer Alliance helps because it inspires you that other people of your age did these amazing projects all around the world and that you can do it too. So I would also recommend that. Now we got a question regarding a specific issue that someone is having. She said, I am having trouble finding space for a sort of experiment project I plan on doing using sun rays to clean water. It will take uh, quite a bit of space, but I don't know how to go around asking for space. What would you recommend? I can sort of start this one off. So for me, um, when I was trying to find space for my lab, I, again, I just went around asking, sending a bunch of emails out. Unfortunately, the, uh, an aquarium in my community responded and said, yeah, sure, we'd love to help out. We'd love to give you space. So again, my advice in this one is just, ask as many people as possible and just get your word out there and get your ideas and your experiment out there and then there'll definitely be there'll definitely be people who are willing to help you yeah just taking the first step my space now is actually uh where i sort the books and i you know pack up the books is in my garage but it used to be in a storage unit so kind of just researching places in your community that might provide you that space um, for me, it was a storage unit that I could bike to and sort books on the weekends. Um, so yeah, just, you know, researching, finding places like that. Um, my space was actually in my basement, like storing all the food that I got, but um, just reaching out and like emailing and making sure like to have like this 30 second, like kind of elevator pitch. So like to have grab their attention from the beginning. That's one thing I learned a lot is just not to keep talking a lot but instead just like go straight to the point in the beginning so they realize like what you're trying to do. So that's my advice. Thank you guys for all these amazing insights. Uh, the next question is regarding like when you're in school and you are trying to create an, an environmental club, one is very passionate and like one shares all the ideas that one had, that one had about how we can make a change in the community. However, Sometimes kids are not interested. So one person for the public is asking, how can I make this come to life when kids are not interested? So one thing at my school that we really love is coming together and hosting kind of school-wide events. So maybe if you could host a school-wide event kind of in combination um, with the promotion of your club, it could be maybe a movie night or an ice cream night, uh, something like that, while also trying to promote your club and getting signups for your club. I definitely think it will help because you will have people um, face to face that you'll be able to talk to, that you'll be able to share your passions with. And I don't want to say it's kind of harder for them to say no, but it's going to be easier for you to share your passions and you know, get the word out of your project when they're all right there in one space. I agree. And um, also like this week, um, we did uh, for Science National Honor Society, we did Earth Week all this week. And we did like little challenges every day. And um, one of them was drawing the um, 
water cycle and you have to tape it to yourself and walk around at school. But the thing is, like, if you sent in pictures in Instagram, you go into a raffle and we're doing like um, doing um, target gift cards as prizes. And also we've been doing if you donate bottle caps and then they're going to write their names and they can pull it out and also get a gift card possibly from that. So just like doing little um, games or like these raffles, they will like spark interest. But then um, soon, like people will start to understand that it, it is they have like a positive impact with um, there's a lot of cleanups that our school is hosting and they give community service hours, obviously. And for all these honor societies or um, student council that they're doing, they can obviously have those hours to school. So they have a benefit and they can soon understand the impact of what they're doing for environment. For both Chase and Navita make great points and I completely agree with them. I'd also like to add that educating, educating maybe not all kids in your school or not all of your friends may understand the importance and the impact that needs to be made. So in my case, educating my friends on the importance and the future we're going to have if we don't make the difference really got them interested as well. So educating is definitely important. Definitely write those amazing strategies that the speakers are talking about. And the next question is uh, targeted to Navira. Uh, someone asked you, what issues have you faced while furthering your projects, especially when you are incentivizing businesses? Um, thank you for the question. Um, one personal struggle at the beginning was um, when Four Girls for Change initially started, I was trying to take on too much at the beginning. So I failed to designate roles at the beginning with so four girls for change. It's me, my sister, two of my cousins, and recently actually one of my family friend um, joined as well. So at the beginning, I tried taking on too much with taking all the phone calls, trying to reach out at the same time and do social media posts. But then I soon realized that I was going to get burned out and I would not be able to balance with school with that. So designating roles early on really helped me um, help this um, organization to be stable like and it's still going on today and also another issue with specifically with my project was um, for the reduced food wastage project with McDonald's actually there was this one week where McDonald's called me and they were asking why the food hadn't been picked up for two weeks and I hadn't known about this and I found out that actually one of the pickup drivers um, they were diagnosed early stages with Alzheimer's so they didn't um they were going through a hard time and they didn't know who else could pick up the food so one thing was that me and my dad pitched in to help pick up the food for a few weeks until they found somebody new but little um communication was something that really helped me uh, str um, thrive in this organization because um, making sure to communicate with these organizations constantly is what will only allow it to be sustainable. So those issues, like they were solved by making sure like to having good communication. So those are some personal struggles that I had, but um, eventually, like, obviously it's fine now and it's going on, like this project is still going on, like McDonald's, my initial one. So that was a few of my problems that we had, but in the end, it, you can solve them if you have the um, a great team around you with I fortunately did have with um, my organization and also just having good communication skills. So yeah. thank you for the question. Communication skills are very important when you create a campaign and thank you for sharing your experiences. After when you are on midway or like finishing your campaign, there are, we have to measure the impact. So I wanna ask you guys, what statistics were most valuable in your project's accomplishments as one person in the public asked? I would say the most important statistic um, for my project is that I've impacted 55,000 kids in my county. And this is an important statistic um, other than the fact that I've donated so many books is because I am directly impacting the these kids um, and their ability to read and their ability to comprehend and to be confident in themselves. And um, I think that's very important. Um, one statistic that was important for me was that actually, according to EPA, that 8.3 pounds of methane gas emissions is produced from 100 pounds of food waste. So donating over 1,500 pounds of um, food that was redirected instead of uh, redirected to the homeless shelters instead of 
the landfill like actually reduced around 130 pounds of methane gas emissions. So that was something that was amazing for me because just one single restaurant at the time. So it was just McDonald's for that statistic. Like we were able to show this proof of concept to the local mom and pop restaurants, which was um, able to convince these restaurants to further like invest in this project. So having those statistics are very beneficial if you want to like expand it. So I'm very grateful that this project was working out and a lot of uh, local mom and pops were able to get convinced because of that. that's really pushed me forward especially with uh this mangrove project again is that the fact that mangroves actually sequester more carbon than traditional rainforests which is really interesting mangroves also reach maturity at a rate much faster so i mean these trees really are needed and are nature's number one solution to helping halt and slowing down climate change another thing that's interesting to me is that florida south florida south miami once was a mangrove forest and through industrialization we've cut down these mangroves to make room for views of the ocean and new buildings but in reality this is leading to incidents like the collapse of a building and it's also with the rising sea levels it's going to make it's making way for new seawalls to be built and interestingly enough these seawalls are going to block the views that these mangroves originally had blocked so yeah i mean the importance of mangroves has really pushed me forward and have really shown me how important they are. Thank you, guys. Uh, each one of you have created amazing projects for the environment and for your communities. And sometimes balancing this kind of commitment with other parts of life is so hard, but important. So the next question from the public is, how do you guys take care of yourselves? Like, how do all of you take care of yourself. I think I can go. So one way that I take care of myself is through physical activity. So I get involved um, with my high school swimming and I'm also involved in a club swimming. And I think that, you know, I work really hard at school throughout the day and through my um, with my projects, but near the end of the day, I get to go to swim practice. I get to see my friends and I get to kind of reflect while I'm in the water. So I think physical activity is very important. Along the same lines as Chase, I mean, I do crew at my school, which it's really good being on a sport that's really like a team, or like, because I mean, you can't row the boat alone. You have to do it with your team. So that component of being with your friends, your classmates, really helps me. Also, I mean, cruise on the water, cruise in nature, and I really like to spend time in nature. It gives me a sense of relaxation and a sense of reflection, just like Chase. Well, I also do crew as well. And um, also the physical activity is what has helped me the most. Um, I've played um, um, field hockey, basketball, and rowing for all four years of high school. So that is something that's kept me on my schedule because I think time management skills was something I struggled with at the beginning, but balancing this and with Poor Girls for Change is what helped me um, thrive. And it's really helped me a lot because I feel like I'm mentally like in a better place right now. And it's just, it's helped me get through a lot of stuff as well. So I'm very grateful for a physical activity, like helping with me. Thank you very much guys for sharing your habits. And I wanna thank the public too, for taking this time of your evening to learn with me about these um, amazing speakers. So I guess without further ado, I would like to uh, pass the word to Courtney from Canada Planet Foundation. Yeah, no, this has been an incredible conversation. Thank all of you. Thank you, John, for, for moderating. Thank the three of you for the incredible work you're doing. Um, and I hope everybody who's listening has been inspired. Um, and, you know, I, I think that question about how do you start is always, it's the hardest part, right? Like it's, it's, I think the two hardest parts are figuring out what piece of the puzzle you want to address because there's so much, right? Like, and, and so many of us that care want to do it all. Right. And so I think knowing that you're part of this bigger movement that, that everybody's doing a piece and you're not alone, um, and then starting, right. And figuring it out. Your things are going to change. It's okay. You don't have to have it all figured out when you get started. Um, I think, you know, those are two great pieces of advice. So thank you all. 
Uh, happy Earth Week. Go outside. Uh, I think all of you agree that going outside and just reflecting is helpful. Um, so please take a moment this, this week to do that. Um, and we're really excited that we were able to do this. So thank you all so much. Happy Earth Week. And we will see you soon. Thank you Have so much. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank you all for joining. If you are interested in re-watching this, please head over to our YouTube channel, NSHSS, and you all may see the recording tomorrow. Have a good night.